Hey y'all, it's Jay. So today we're going to continue risk management. We're going to talk about environmental risk. And environmental risk is, <clears throat> we talked last week about personal risk, which are things that are intrinsic to you that cause you a risk in your game. Today we're going to talk about environmental risk. That's things that are not you, but are part of the surrounding thing. We're going to talk about you know the weather, the the crowd, the venue, the equipment, those kinds of things. So we're going to talk about those. Meantime, I'm going to put some straight pool in the background for you so you can uh, have something to watch while I talk through this. So when we're talking about environmental risk, there are many things that you can't control. Uh, and there are some that you can. And, and risk is more about being aware of the risk uh, and being aware of how it affects your game. So there are a lot of things that we can't control. For example, um, in the snooker, I think it was in the World Masters one year, uh, they had wasps attacking the players in the venue. Uh, now, I'm sure that nobody ever expected to have to play snooker while being attacked by wasps. Um, you just can't control things like that. So when we're talking about the environment, we're talking about things like uh, the weather. Uh, so temperature and humidity specifically. So the temperature affects you as a person. If you're hot, in, if it's hot enough in the venue that you're sweating, uh, then you're going to play pool less at a lesser level than you will if the, the temperature is ideal, simply because you're uncomfortable. Uh, likewise, if it's extremely cold in the venue, uh, you will play pool less, act, you'll, you'll play less well because you're cold, not just because you're uncomfortable, but also because maybe your muscles are shivering. And so your stroke isn't as pure, you can't feel your stroke the way you normally would. Um, so what can you do about those? Well, about it being hot, you can, I mean, the answer to both of those is dress appropriately. Uh, if it's hot, then you want to wear something lighter, maybe moisture wicking. Um, you see the jerseys that the players are wearing. Uh, those are mostly from Ultimate Team Gear, uh, and they are moisture wicking. Uh, and extremely light. I, I love those, uh, their shirts. I have a couple of them. Um, not ones from events, but just a couple that I bought just because I think they look good and they, they feel good when you wear them. Uh, and so if you're going, if you're playing in a major tournament uh, that's in a, a hotel ballroom or a convention center or something like that, you'll find that early in the day it's colder than it is later in the day. And the reason for that is they cool it down anticipating a lot of people and so they they cool it, overcool it to compensate for the extra body heat that's going to be in the room. And so uh, so you know that in the more if you have a morning match, you should probably at least bring something warm in case it's too cold. Okay, what about uh, humidity? Well, if it's dry, uh, the table acts differently than when it's wet. So if it's extremely dry, the table will be very fast. Uh, the cue ball will slide quite a bit. Uh, if, it's, if it's wet, if it's high humidity, then the table is going to play slower and the cue ball is going to get more friction from the grab on the felt. Um, and so you need to uh, think about those things. And you also need to think, like in the example before with the temperature, if you're playing in a convention center, in the morning it's going to be very dry because they will be running the air conditioner all night long, getting it down to a temperature to compensate for body heat. In the afternoon, it'll be about where it, what, what you would call normal. And in the evening, it will be wet. And the reason for that is you will have a lot of people in there who are breathing and their, their moisture from their breath is getting into the air and it will get into the table. Also, if you're playing on a in, in a major tournament that has a TV table, the TV table will always be hotter 
and drier than the other tables around it. So you need to, in your 10-minute warm-up, and we're going to do a complete video on the 10-minute warm-up, but during that time you need to establish the speed and the, uh, and the wetness of the table because it will be different from all the other tables and it will be different from the practice tables. So that's an environmental risk is that you go to play on the TV table and it's different from every other table that you could have possibly played on uh, other than the TV table itself. Um, what else is an environmental risk? Well, the spectators are an environmental risk. Uh, what I mean by that is that they can move around, they can talk, um, somebody can shout just as you're getting ready to shoot. So you need to plan <clears throat> to have a way to ignore that. And, and the best way to do that is to just train it. Um, the Whenever I'm, I'm playing pool, I have a mixture of all different kinds of music turned up fairly loud uh, so that I can get to the point where I'm not paying attention to the music. Uh, it's just background noise and my and, and it's changing and sometimes it's it's slow and soft and some and it'll go from something really slow and soft into something really, really hard and heavy. Uh, there will be volume changes, things like that. and, and that all will affect your game. So training for distraction, is a big deal. Um, you know, you've, I've, I've said before that part of my dog's uh, job is to distract me. And you'll see her at times in some of the videos come up and just, she'll, she'll jump on me. She'll, she'll bark. Um, she does a really good job of distracting me. Uh, so distractions from spectators, that's an environmental risk. And again, you can't really do anything about it. You can't, you have to trust the referee to keep control of the crowd and things like that uh, if you have that kind of tournament. <clears throat> uh, but you have to train yourself to mitigate those types of risks. One of the biggest things is you have to be, with environmental risk, is you have to be aware of your surroundings, okay? If you're playing pool in a tournament that's in a convention center, it is an entirely different case than playing uh, pool in a pool hall or a bar. Um, in a in in a pool hall or a bar, you always have the risk of, you know, drunk people or people who've had just a few too many uh, being loud and obnoxious. And um, you know, I I was. Uh, I was playing some pool against Johnny at uh, the American Legion, <clears throat> and I mentioned that in one of my other videos. Uh, and we were playing straight pool. We got to the end of the rack, and uh, I was racking, and somebody walked up and picked the the uh, the break ball up off of the table, um, which of course would end the game. Um, I mean, you really can't continue then. But because I was aware of what was going around, I was able to get my finger down just as he picked it up to mark the spot so we could put it back and continue playing without interruption. Um, but you always have those kinds of risks. And you and the best way to, to mitigate them is to be aware of them. If you're playing in an unfamiliar pool hall, you have to be aware of everything around you, especially if you're gambling. Uh, and especially if you're gambling for bigger money. Uh, because you never know who the other people in the pool hall are. That guy you're playing that's such a nice guy that uh, is uh, is losing and donating, you know, a lot of money to you, his buddy may be sitting over there at the bar just waiting for you to turn your back so he can steal your cues. You just have to be, you just have to be aware. Um, you have to know what's going on around you, and you have to stay aware. Uh, that's part of the reason I don't drink when I shoot pool. I, I don't want to um, I don't want to become unaware of the surroundings. Okay, so we spent a lot of time on that. The, the main thing is pay attention to what's going ar on around you. Know what uh, what environment you're in, um, and know how that's going to affect your game. Now, the biggest environmental factor 
is the equipment. The balls, are they clean or dirty? If they're clean, then everything works the way it's supposed to. Your English will do what you think it's going to do. Um, but if they're dirty, that makes the cue ball cling just a little bit longer to the ball. That changes the shot angle for making the ball. That changes how the cue ball will react after the hit. Um, so you have to be aware of those things. Um, and it can be deceptive. You can have a cue ball that has a, a, a bunch of blue dots from contact, and that cue ball is actually clean because those dots are stains, not surface dust. Uh, the best way to, to deal with that is bring a, a microfiber towel with you, a uh, micro, microfiber cloth, and wipe off the cue ball and see if the dots come off. If they do, it was dirt. Uh, if you are, if the balls are actually sticky, which I've seen in some bars, um, it makes it actually possible to make shots that you can't make normally. Um, it also uh, allows you to throw the ball a lot further if you need to use spin to to throw the object ball, uh, or two balls that are frozen to throw them into a pocket. You can do a whole lot more if it's sticky than you can when they're clean, uh, but it also adds an element of unpredictability to it. What about the tables? Uh, so different manufacturers of tables have different specifications. We all know that. Okay, let's take gold crowns and diamonds, for example. Uh, so my table's a, a gold crown, <clears throat> and uh, so on a gold crown, they use super speed rails, which are... Uh, super speed rails are, they play longer than the Artemis rails <clears throat> that are used on diamond tables. So a diamond table plays shorter than a gold crown does. But if you were to come in with that assumption on my table, you'd be wrong because I have Artemis rails on my table, which by the way, I'm going to get rid of because I don't like the job the guy did in installing them. Um, so uh, the table is going to, the, the cue ball is going to act differently off the rail on a diamond than it does on a gold crown, which is going to be completely different from how it acts on, a, on an Olhausen. Another factor to be aware of is that on diamond tables, the, uh, the pocket facings or the, the inside of the, the pocket, the, the area uh, with the short rail just outside the pocket that helps the ball into the pocket. On a diamond, those are parallel, which means that the opening where the points are is the same as the opening of the throat. So if you have four inch pockets, or let's say four and a half inch pockets, um, on a diamond, it's four and a half inches wide between the points of the pocket, and it's also four and a half inches wide at what they call the throat, which is where the actual uh, drop off is on a gold crown the pockets are at a 51 degree angle so what that means effectively is that if the if it's four and a half inches wide at the point which is where it's measured if it's four and a half inches wide at the point it is less than four and a half inches at the throat it's actually pretty close it, it's actually below four inches at the at the uh, throat so what that means is that uh, the, that means that trying to shoot straight into the pocket on a gold crown is actually a little bit easier than it is on a diamond. And the reason is because of those angles. So because the angle on the gold crown is... Uh, is wider than parallel, it means that the pockets help the ball in when they're coming in from the center of the table. And it means that coming down the rail, it's actually harder because the pockets are going to kick the ball out. Now, diamond compensates for that by having a deeper shelf. So on a diamond, the distance from the points to the throat is two inches. And on a gold crown, 
it's one inch. So effectively, it means that if you're shooting on a, if you're making a decision on whether to shoot a shot that's down the rail that has a, a fairly decent position uh, versus shooting a shot that's in the center of the table that has similar position. Uh, on a gold crown, you would choose the one that's in the center of the table because it's easier to make uh, than it is down the rail. And on a diamond, you, you would shoot the one down the rail. So your decision making is affected by that environment. So all in all, what I'm telling you is that when you get into an environment, you need to assess it for risks. You need to assess the conditions, and then you need to take whatever steps are necessary to mitigate those risks. So when I talk environmental risk, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so next time we're going to get into shot risks, we're going to take those a lot more in depth. We're going to talk about them specifically on each shot and how to deal with them. The environmental and the personal risks, you got to kind of come up with your own strategy. If you like what you saw, hit like, hit subscribe, ding the notification bell, and we'll see you next time.